you give rats in a cage a lever that dispenses food. So they're gonna push it when they're hungry, get the food and go back to their normal things. But what was noticed in these behavioral studies is that if you change that, make it unpredictable, they become obsessed with pushing it. They start ignoring their self-care and it just becomes the main thing they focus on. Welcome to another episode of Yalla Let's Talk. Today, we're gonna to be talking about drugs and addiction, and we have no other than Dr. Mark Dagger. Dr. Mark is a Lebanese Canadian physician based here in Toronto. He did his medical training, including his residency in family medicine and fellowship in addiction medicine at the University of Toronto. He currently works as an addiction medicine physician in both academic and community settings. Thank you very much for coming here today with Dr. Dagger. Thank you, Henny, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It'll be interesting to talk to you in this different context. Uh, I have to put my professional hat on. Yes. Just uh, don't get me in trouble. I won't get you in trouble. We can edit everything and anything <laughs> out. Dr. Dagger is one of my best friends. He's like a brother from another mother. And this topic has always surfaced when it comes to uh, the topic of both love as well as when we look at addiction and we look at drugs as we have people around us using it, when do we identify in others or even in ourselves addiction and how we can help overcome it? So before we even begin, I think what's really important is defining what addiction is. So Dr. Mark, what is addiction? It's a good question, Hanny. You wouldn't think it's a controversial question. It sounds very simple. Uh, but research has this ability sometimes to make things a bit more complicated. Uh, and researchers actually don't fully agree on one model that defines addiction. Typically what happens over the years uh, and over history of research, uh, this model has changed. And what we believe addiction is now, it's not what they believed 50 years ago, so it's evolving. But I'll just give you my simplistic definition because I think that's, most, uh, that's a bit more helpful than getting into the models, uh, the research models. The way I would define addiction uh, is addiction is a disorder where someone does something compulsively over and over despite its harm. Mm. So if I break that, that, break that down a little bit, uh, the first word I use is a disorder. There's an assumption of a dysfunction or an impairment in the person's life. Mm -hmm. And when I say the, the person is doing something that could be either, as you mentioned in your intro, drugs or what we call substances for the broad category of drugs, alcohol, smoking, we call all of those substances, or even behaviors. The most common one being that most people know is gambling. That's a type of addiction, the behavioral addiction, and there are others as well. Mm -hmm. And, and compuls compulsion is a big component of addiction. So what compulsion is, is a strong urge to do something even if you consciously don't really want to do it. And you're doing this over and over despite its harm. So there's an assumption also of the thing being harmful. Like, for example, you're not addicted to water, even though you're going to drink it regularly. Mm -hmm. So there's something that's harming you that's causing a disorder and you're doing it compulsively over and over again. OK, so well, thank you very much for that uh, definition of addiction. I think it puts a lot of what we're going to be talking about today in context. And I like the, the key word here you used, which is harm and using that water as an example, because you're right, we do a lot of things repetitively, but it is the things that we do repetitively that cause us harm. Uh, and just the word addiction, and I just want to take it back and just to simplify this as well. Um, when someone says they have an addictive personality, like, you know, we, we're, we talk to our friends like, oh, I can't do this. I have an mm -hmm. addictive personality. How much of that is a myth and how much is that? is true. How do you know if you have an addictive personality? The short answer to that is that there isn't really an addictive personality. I think that's a bit too simplistic of what addiction is. When you say addictive personality, there's a bit of an assumption there that there's something about you or about a specific person uh, that predicts addiction and there are no other factors. And then the, uh, there's also the, the opposite assumption that there's some people that are just immune to addictions. Mm -hmm. But none of this is predictable. Instead of, a predi instead of an addictive personality, uh, what there is, there's a bunch of 
uh, predictive factors maybe or risk factors that might increase your risk or predispose you uh, to have an addiction. So must, some people are more likely to develop an addiction than others. And those factors, we usually actually group them uh, in, th in three levels. One of them is relating to the substance itself. And I'm going to talk about substances moving forward because that's really what I do for work. But these things do apply mm -hmm. to behavioral addictions as well. But just for simplicity, I'm going to talk about substances. So something that relates to the substance, for example, um, if you're designing a substance that you want someone to get addicted to it, what would you want it to do? You would want it to hit your reward centers, right? You want mm -hmm. the reward centers mm -hmm. for those who don't know. Uh, it's, it's a part of your brain that is activated when you do something uh, that you de derive a reward from. This can be like something complicated, like accomplishing a goal or something, something simple like eating or having sex or something like that. This is what drives you to do those behaviors again. It's that reward center and it's mm -hmm. the main neurotransmitter, which is the chemical in the brain that's used for neurons to communicate in the center is dopamine. So you hear a lot about dopamine and et cetera. So I'm just introducing these terms because they will come up, I'm sure. Um, so when you're talking about things that could increase your risk of addiction, when you're talking about the substance itself, you want a substance that will hit your reward center hard. You mm -hmm, want it to mm -hmm. hit the, the, those centers fast. And ideally, you don't want it to last that long. You want it to come off. That way you do it again. And then you go in that cycle where you have this reward and then withdrawal in a way. Mm -hmm. And then you keep doing it. So those are characteristics of the substance, right? If you have a substance that lasts for a long time or doesn't acti activate your reward centers, you're not going to care for it. That's not going to cause an addiction, right? Um, the other factor is you have to look at the person. There are things that predispose people to, to be more likely than others to develop an addiction. Some of them are genetic. Uh, so for example, in one family, if you have a parent that has an addiction, you are more likely to have one. Uh, just statistically, it doesn't mean that you will, but it just increases your chance. And other factors are, uh, for example, mental health disorders. So if you, somebody has depression, anxiety, ADHD, all those things are known to increase your risk of using substances and developing mm. addiction. And the third factor, so the first two were substance and then the user, mm -hmm. and the third one is the situation. So let's say today, for example, I gave you... Um, you know, a pill of Xanax, mm -hmm. and you're not going through a difficult time. And we can define what those uh, drugs are later, if, if that's uh, of interest. And you just feel the calming effect of it, and then you move on, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're not developing an addiction. But then let me put you in another situation. You had an unfortunate loss in your life. You're going through a hard time, a heartbreak, or something difficult that you're going through. Mm -hmm. You're going to see this use differently. You're going to use it differently. It's going to fill a void. It's going to do serve a different function for you than it would now. So you have to look at those three factors mm -hmm. together. So again, it's not much of a personality, addictive personality. It's a bit more complicated than, than that. You have to look at the substance, the user, and the situation. So basically, this whole addictive personality is just people being a little extra, saying, I have an addictive personality. A little bit. Yeah, I like how you're nodding. Like, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you're right. There are different factors. It's not just someone who may have a certain personality trait. I liked how you kind of defined it. And I think mental health is something that people may overlook because sometimes people will take drugs uh, as an escape mm -hmm. and then it may lead to an addiction. And uh, we're going to talk more about the use of drugs and therapy in, in a bit. But I just wanted to also ask when it comes to addiction and in the type of work that you do, you probably see a lot of people come to you with addiction. What would you say is the most common story? What leads people to an addiction? Uh, I'm very glad you asked that, Hany, actually, because it's very, very important, I think, to realize uh, that somebody that has an addiction, I should say people who have an addiction don't all look the same. Sometimes we all have our preconceived notions about how someone might present with an addiction. But I'll tell you, that's not always true. I'll give you some examples. Mm -hmm. Some, some situations that lead to people uh, ending up in my clinic, for example, uh, do result from someone growing up in what we might call a dysfunctional home. Uh, in other words, having a lot of trauma in their childhood. Mm -hmm. And then they're introduced to substances early on, they get used to this coping strategy, and then they uh, develop an addiction 
or or use disorders the other words we use uh, medically they develop that early on mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but that's not everyone i've seen many people who have never used substances in their life and for example they go for surgery or have dental work then prescribed a short course of painkillers and then a year later they're in my clinic because now they can't get off of it mm. they have problems in their house uh, in their homes in their relationships uh, and that's that's another situation where this comes up. Another uh, a different scenario that I see is uh, in the professional world. A lot of professions have certain cultures uh, that relate to substance use around their work. Uh, a lot of people go out, for example, I don't know, for drinks after work with clients maybe or with mm-hmm. their team. And that's a regular thing. They tell you this is part of my work. Mm-hmm. But then it becomes a problem when then it becomes part of your life. Right, not just your, your lifestyle. Exactly, and mm-hmm. that some people end up in our clinic in that uh, in that way. And then there are also some people where, let's say, you went in undergrad, partying, started using drugs. For most people, it'll end there. But then for some people, it sticks, and then they develop a use disorder or an addiction as well. I like how you put it. It's just you first start without really realizing that it may become an addiction. I don't think of anyone course. who starts it's like, oh, I'm going to be addicted to this. But the, it's the surrounding factors that in a way pushes you to to have it become part of your lifestyle then then can lead into an addiction and have that compulsive behavior that is harmful exactly. for you exactly i'm glad you you brought that up as well because yeah. it's it's another important point where sometimes people especially if you're not familiar with the world yeah. of addiction there's a bit of unfortunately blaming the person mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you're choosing this almost right mm-hmm. uh I, I guarantee you, no one I'm seeing is choosing their current struggle, right? It's a struggle that they're overcoming. How do you identify in someone you love that they may have an addiction? I think that's a, that's a good opportunity. Actually, let me tell you what addiction, what an addiction looks like clinically. And I think that will help answer that question. Mm-hmm. Um, when someone, when we see someone in clinic and we're trying to make a diagnosis of addiction, we go through a list of criteria that we, we use to, to define an addiction. Uh, I'm not going to just list them. I think that's a little boring, but I'll tell you how they fit in categories. There's actually four categories, main ones that you can use to, to notice it in yourself or in others. The first one is loss of control. That's a very big one. And examples of that is um, if you use a substance or you use something more than you intend to, mm-hmm. let's say... Uh, you want to go out for a drink or you want to smoke a cigarette or smoke one joint or something like that. And then all of a sudden one becomes 10 mm-hmm. and an hour becomes overnight and you just lost control over that episode, over that session of use. Mm-hmm. That's an example of loss of control. Another one is uh, for some people, uh, the substance becomes so central to their life. Mm-hmm. They spend mm-hmm. most of their days either looking how to get it, using it or recovering from it. Mm-hmm. So it really becomes the core, really, that's all you're doing. And that's also you're losing control about the, mm-hmm. on the, of the substance. Another one, an important one, is multiple attempts to, to reduce or cut back, right? Let's say, let's say you're using, uh, I don't know, you're smoking. By the way, I'm saying you conversationally. Just a disclaimer okay. to everyone, Hanny knows nothing yeah, about Mama, smoking. Mama, I am not doing drugs. Or drugs or anything. <laughs> just humor me. This is just a conversational you. <laughs> so let's say you're smoking and I tell you, you know what, Hanny, I noticed you're smoking more. This is harming you. And you're like, you're right. I'm going to stop it. And you stop it and you're successful at it. That doesn't indicate that you don't have control. But if you've tried many times to stop mm. and then the next day comes and then you pick it up, that's loss of control. So that's one, loss of control. Exactly. And another one is uh, social dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So relationship in your life become problematic. Um, You can't hold work. Uh, It doesn't have to be as extreme as you can't hold work. You start missing some days of work, Mm -hmm. calling in sick more, rescheduling things for work. Um, Giving up hobbies is another big one. Let's say you're someone who likes, I don't know, painting, dancing, singing. You have other hobbies. You might give those up because for the substance use, that all together, that indicates some social impairment or dysfunction. Mm-hmm. The third big category is physical impairment. So again, if, if, if uh, let's say you're someone who has a few drinks, you come to clinic, I run a few tests, and I tell you your liver is inflamed, but despite knowing that, uh, you, keep, you keep drinking, despite knowing that there's harm. 
Mm. And that applies to other substances as well, of course. Uh, that indicates an addiction or at least raises the suspicion that there's an addiction when you continue using despite physical impairment. And the other big one under physical impairment is when you put yourself in dangerous situations because of use. And an another common thing here is driving under the influence, for example. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just I, I want to just go back to the, that question. So just for like a layman person, like you're chilling with your friends, you see a friend who may may not have an addiction. Is there anything that you can just pick up and see like this person may have an addiction? Not just from seeing them, no. Like you do have to know more. This is not, again, this is not you can look at someone and know that they have this condition. You do have to know more about them. Again, those categories, you have to know that is there a problem with control around the substance? Mm -hmm. Is there a problem? Are they having social problems because of the substance? Are there physical problems because of the substance? You know, like mm -hmm. things like that. What advice would you give to someone if someone they loved, if they think someone they loved may have an addiction based on all the factors you've listed? I think the most important thing is coming to it from a place of compassion. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we think we, we try to take this approach of tough love. Mm -hmm, or you mm -hmm. know tough it up or just get over it mm -hmm. kind of thing and i guarantee you i've never seen someone recover or heal with that approach was just saying them you know like why don't you just stop mm -hmm. using kind of thing so so i think coming at it from a place of compassion establishing a good relationship expressing your concerns mm -hmm. and really connecting them with help uh, obviously you have to be open to it but yeah. I think making yourself available to them is a, is a I'd say it's the most important thing you can do and that's beautifully said because you're right we have to be compassionate with everybody uh, at the same time connecting them to the right resources not everyone you know is a doctor in addiction that can actually identify it and provide them with the right treatment um, so thank you for mentioning that I want to just dive right now into another topic and I think this is just how do we actually start having a conversation mm -hmm. about drugs and addiction in a culture that basically overlooks drugs and mm -hmm. addiction and does not even acknowledge the use of drugs? Yeah. Like how could parents talk to their children about the use of drugs? According to my mom, you should not be t even talking <laughs> about it. Listen, I'll tell you, there, that's a bit of a delicate question in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, I think what it gets at is um, should there be an acceptance of drug use or should there or should we have a complete like zero tolerance kind of approach mm -hmm. to it? I think that's correct me if I'm wrong. Like that's a little embedded in that question, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Logically, the safest way to avoid any harm from drugs and not developing an addiction is, of course, not using the same way that uh, the safest way to not get a sunburn, for example, is avoiding the sun, uh, but you might choose to go in the sun and you might take precautions to reduce the risk. So you're saying everyone's gonna do drugs one day. That's not, what no, 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 but I'm, <laughs> but I'm saying there's, uh, the, if you wanna eliminate the risk entirely, the mm -hmm. same way you might wanna eliminate the risk of a sunburn, don't go in the sun. Mm -hmm. If you wanna eliminate the risk entirely, uh, don't use drugs. But we do know, but here's the harm of this approach of just having this mentality. I'm not encouraging drug use. I'm just saying that the risk from having zero tolerance is that from experience in other fields mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and from this field as well, it doesn't result in less doing. It results in more stigma. It results in more shame and mm -hmm. people accessing treatment less and getting help less. So I'm not saying go encourage your, you know, to, to, to your question, to the parent, uh, encourage your child to do drugs. Uh, but at the same time, don't, if you want to know about it, to be able to offer them help, the first step is making it a safe space to even talk about it. Mm -hmm. Because in a lot of places, it's not, as you said, it's a big taboo uh, that people don't talk about it. They don't seek help for it. And I'll tell you, even in those places where it is there's yeah. a big cultural taboo around it there's still use i guarantee you when it comes to party settings you see a lot of people consuming cocaine molly um ketamine and the list goes on can you tell us a little bit more about how could party settings lead to addictions when it comes to the use of drugs 
I think, uh, as, as you said, drug use in party settings is, um, is uh, quite relatively common. Um, the way it leads to an addiction goes back to the points that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you're using, if someone's using it intermittently only where they're, then they're at the party mm -hmm. and it has no impact on their life otherwise, it's unlikely that they would have an addiction or yeah. that would meet criteria for an addiction. But once you start, once it starts taking an exaggerated role in your life, it starts becoming central to your life, you're losing control again, having social dysfunction, all the things we talked about before, mm -hmm. uh, that's when it becomes a problem. And is there a way to rank the harm of these party drugs? Like, can we say cocaine is worse than Molly or Molly is worse than ketamine? Is there a ranking between for those drugs? What is the ranking for how harmful party drugs are? That's what I said earlier. Don't get me in trouble because it's 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 a it's a bit of an interesting question because there is it's it's a question that a lot of pe people are curious about. Like, what drugs are more harm harmful than others? Policymakers are curious about that. People that you know want to figure out how to make things legal, illegal. Everyone's curious about that. There was a study in the in the Lancet, which is a medical journal based in the UK, that tried to do that. They tried to look at factors, take each drug, and look at factors that uh, cause harm to the user, and factors that cause harm to society as a whole. Like they say, user than others, and combine them together. And guess what scored the highest? What? Alcohol. Alcohol. Alcohol scored the highest higher than heroin and cocaine those were the two that came after that um there's obviously in the discussion you know people discussed it a lot the authors discussed it a lot there is alcohol is more widespread in general mm -hmm. is more accepted in at least the society where they studied it in the uk so that could have contributed to that but in terms of just to answer that question based on that ranking alcohol was the worst party drug followed by heroin, cocaine, and the list goes on. And the least, what do you think the least uh, harmful were? Mm, this is a trick question. Let's see. <laughs> I'm going to say marijuana. No, actually. What, what the least think? harmful in that study was uh, psilocybin or mushroom, magic mushrooms. Ah. The class of psychedelics were the least uh, harmful. So uh, mushrooms, LSD, even MDMA ranked pretty low. Uh, it is classified under psychedelics, even though it doesn't have the same effects as uh, mushrooms. Uh, but those actually classified low in that ranking. In another study, they looked at which drugs might result in you going to emerge. That's another way where they tried to really try all these different ways to rank drugs, you know, to, for Emerg your, emergency. Yeah, exactly. To the emergency department, not your law firm. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to clarify. <laughs> um, and again, one, uh, well, the highest one, alcohol did rank high. But another very high one in that setting was crystal meth, which is used in the party scene as well. Uh, but that resulted in a lot of eMERGE visits. And again, the lowest one in that category was, again, magic mushrooms. Not many people go to, to eMERGE for it. And the rest were in between, cannabis, MDMA, and all mm -hmm. the other ones. So there are different ways uh, that they try to rank. But when it comes to, the, to you as a person, as an individual, you do have to take your own factors into consideration. For example, someone who has heart disease. You probably want to stay away from stimulants like cocaine, crystal meth, amphetamines, all those things, mm -hmm. because that can increase your risk. Someone who has a history of psychosis or something like a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia or something like that, mm -hmm. you probably want to stay from cannabis, even though it ranked lower on the other list. It's extra harmful for you. It's extra harmful. So you have to take your own factors into account. This list doesn't apply to every single person. This is kind of a broad for the population on average. So I want to go back to something you mentioned is the harm that alcohol was more harmful. How is alcohol more harmful than other drugs? Uh, so in this study, again, what they looked at is uh, the factors that relate to you that can harm you as a person, as a user, and the factors that can harm society. So it's more related to uh, the immediate harms of alcohol. And we know from alcohol use for the person, it causes you to make poor decisions. Mm -hmm. It might cause you to uh, get yourself in dangerous situations, falls, uh, you know, if somebody is reckless and drives, uh, you know, like there's a lot of harms that you, for mm -hmm. yourself. And that last one also still 
bleeds into the other, right? If you drive under the influence, you're harming, harming others as well. The increase in violence is big with alcohol. Uh, it's very much associated with uh, to, to violent behavior because again, it's you lose your inhibition. So, so those are the factors that in the short term uh, lead to alcohol ranking high. And again, don't forget that it is a widely used substance, at least in that community in the UK. That's why it ranked mm -hmm. high. Uh, long-term harms, that's besides we're talking about short-term harms, long-term harms, there's a lot of health risks for alcohol use. Everyone knows about the liver, mm -hmm. uh, right? That's a very common thing that people say. It definitely, it's a real thing. It causes liver inflammation and it could lead to failure. But another big one is cancer. There's a lot of cancers uh, that um, alcohol can increase the risk for. So those are more long-term really? harms. So I wonder why, if there's this much harm that alcohol has on our body and our society why is that legal and accessible versus other drugs like that's where i said you're gonna yeah. get me in trouble yeah <laughs> it so is tell, tell it us is. your your take dr dagger <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's an interesting thing you raise like what do um what do i guess lawmakers use to make those decisions mm -hmm. right here in canada cannabis became legal relatively recently, why was it illegal before? Uh, there's a lot of, you know, the list goes on and on. That's, I think, an entire discussion by itself in terms of social context, which populations use which drugs, a st history of stigma, uh, and things that might contribute to lawmakers deciding what's legal and what's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and another factor is uh, something that has no medical use tends to be automatically put on one of the more illegal. I don't know if you know how they schedule drugs in terms of schedule one, two, three. That's more a law question. That's not my expertise, but I, I know about it uh, vaguely. Mm -hmm. And I know drugs that have no medical use, they rank high in terms of how illegal they are. Um, so that's another thing they, uh, they look at. There isn't a direct answer. I think it's a cultural thing that why alcohol is legal because you have, obviously you have some soci societies like in the Arab world where it's illegal, mm -hmm. and that's more of a cultural and religious context, whereas societies where it is legal because of their cultural context. So it's a bit of a, there isn't like a simple uh, answer to why this is legal and this is not. But I like to, where you're alluded this conversation to is that there's a culture and stigma element that goes into why some people might uh, think alcohol is less harmful than other drugs. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Dr. Dagger, if you choose to do drugs, how do you reduce the harm? There's a lot of strategies that we usually counsel people on. Uh, we call them harm reduction strategies uh, when it comes to using drugs. The most obvious one is limiting how much you use and how frequently you use, like the amount and frequency of your use. Mm -hmm. um, Another thing is using with friends as opposed to using alone. Some people choose to use alone. That tends to be a bit higher risk because if something happens, there's no one really to support you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so we don't recommend using alone, or at least we say use with people that's as a way to reduce harm. Uh, if it's a new drug or something or a new batch or something you haven't tried, we always recommend doing a test dose before you actually go to your full dose or normal dose just to make sure there isn't something unusual that you're going to feel uh, or some, something unusual in it. Because that's another unfortunate thing we haven't mentioned. Uh, besides the harm of each drug itself, mm -hmm. there's the harm of an, the unintended use. So drugs that might be put into that drug that you don't know about, right? So for example, cocaine might be laced with fentanyl, mm -hmm. which is a very strong opioid. And this is what I was going to ask you about next, which is, when it comes to drugs and getting drugs from the black market, how do we know that things are not laced? How can we make sure that this is a, a drug that does not have fentanyl and is not going to potentially kill us? So you have to take extra steps to know. You have to go out of, you can't just know because there isn't a trusted source. When something is not regulated and legal, there is no trusted source. Even if someone tells you, don't worry, I got it from someone I trust, There, there's no such thing. It's not mm -hmm. coming from someone uh, that's doing any regulation. 
So there are ways to test for fentanyl specifically. There are strips that you can use at home to test for it. If you, I know this doesn't apply to everyone, but if you're, especially if you're in a major uh, city center, a lot of places have access to actually testing the drug itself anonymously, uh, where you can actually send a very small sample of it, get it tested, and they tell you exactly what's in it. Obviously, that requires a bit of planning, and it's not often how, you know, drug use works in the party scene where people might acquire it on the spot. But that is a way, if you want to reduce harms, uh, that's a way to do it. So uh, if you're, is to make sure that there's nothing nothing contaminating. So this is an excellent point. So if you have drugs, let's just use cocaine as an example. You get some cocaine. You can go to an addiction center. Like how do you then submit it to see if it's laced with fentanyl? Yeah, I want to be cautious because uh, I don't want to recommend th something that's uh, just in our city because I know your listeners aren't all here. Uh, but look at local resources. I think if you look up drug testing yeah. in your city, uh, it would tell you where because there are a few spots mm. in, you know, talking about Toronto where you can do it. I was just thinking about this. Someone in Saudi Arabia is going to be listening. It's like, OK, let me submit this to uh, <laughs> to the hospital. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> there Google, you go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, Yalla, let's talk. Dr. Dagger said it. <laughs> but you know, that's a, that's honestly, I don't know if you want to include this or not, but it's honestly a, a very uh, important point that the advocates of decriminalizations use is when you make something goes back to our earlier point about the zero tolerance approach to anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, if you have that approach, how will you allow people to test? How will you allow people to use, uh, reduce the harms of using or even access treatment? Yeah. Uh, so that's something that's a little, I know it's a controversial topic and mm -hmm. it's not our discussion, but it is something to consider when you make something criminalized and you can't even talk about it or mention it. What does that mean for reducing harms or accessing treatment? It's an excellent uh, policy question uh, that I hope that listeners who are in public advocacy <laughs> are listening to this or policy advocacy um, and will take notes. I want to just now bring this. So actually, before I bring this conversation somewhere else, I have one last question when it comes to this. Uh, do you have any stats that you can share about the likelihood of a drug being laced either with fentanyl or anything that may not be pure? Yeah, actually, uh, again, uh, at the risk of making this uh, about Toronto, uh, we do, uh, you can, anyone can sign up. There's a weekly report that comes out mm -hmm. where uh, there's a surveillance of the drugs that's, uh, that are in circulation. So people that submit their drug anonymously for testing, mm -hmm. uh, they keep track of it and they tell you like this percentage of this has that, uh, and that changes every week. It's updated every week. And we know that, for example, uh, someone who uses opioids, sometimes it's up to half, 50% of the times it's laced with something called benzodiazepines like Xanax, for example, or something in that family that increases the risk of sedation. So what about, and I'm going to ask this as a very a simple question, because I, from what I understand, cocaine is one of the most popular uh, drugs out there for party settings. What is the chance for the cocaine that you have has fentanyl laced in it? I don't know the statistic for that off the top of my mind, um, but it's it's something, it is a concern. It's not, I don't want to say it's, you know, I don't want to make it seem like it's not a problem. Mm. It's not the most common thing that it's laced with. There are other things that it could be laced with, uh, but it is. it does happen. It does happen. Even MDMA, we've seen it happen where it's laced with a, a strong opioid and somebody overdoses on opioid and they've never used that in their life, like fentanyl. Oh, that is quite sad. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you for sharing. Uh, so Dr. Dagger, I want to actually now move this conversation into kind of like an overarching theme of this season, which is really about relationships and love. And I think the first question I have is when you were talking about addiction right now, uh, Addiction can also be applied in the love setting. So first question I have, can love be an addiction? I think by our definition of an addiction that we talked about earlier, um, luckily not all love is an addiction. Luckily there's healthy love out there, mm -hmm. but I do think in some situations, uh, love can be very similar to an addiction. Um, 
interestingly, there's a psychiatrist based in the in the States, um, and he has a book called Brain and Love. He has an interest in taking images of the brain and trying to understand uh, based on what you see, what events happened, and, and linking those together. And he says new love, he uses that word, new love meaning the early stages of a relationship when it's you're not the most rational. He says it looks like cocaine in the brain. It, like you can't tell them apart. Someone who took cocaine and someone who's newly in love, they look the same. He says, don't make any decisions when you're in this phase because your access to rational thinking is is uh, is not there. Same as what we say when you're on uh, cocaine or anything, like don't make decisions uh, that are very important to you because you're not being very rational. Um, the problem happens is that from that stage, either you're going to evolve, by the way, this is not what I do clinically. This is me venturing outside, outside of that. Mm -hmm. uh, you're either evolving to something stable, right? Mm -hmm. Like a stable kind of love, like no longer new love, or you're losing that attachment and moving on, or you're entering that kind of toxic stage that is, has a lot of similarities to addiction, honestly, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of cycles of, after this phase that we said looks like cocaine, yeah. you might stop, cut the person out, and then you might, you know, relapse or go back to them. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to have guilt and shame, then withdrawal, then you, you, you're stuck in a similar cycle to someone that has an addiction. And you know that the, there's a lot of similarities to that. And when, when you're going through that withdrawal, it feels like a withdrawal, mm -hmm. right? People describe this very uncomfortable feeling. They describe physical symptoms mm -hmm. of, I can't sleep. I can't eat, anxiety, heart racing, panic attacks, potentially a lot of things that we do see in withdrawal. They're just getting them from, you know, the state the, that we want to call like this toxic state of like, maybe you want to call it love withdrawal. I don't know what the term for mm -hmm. it is, uh, but there's a lot of similarities there. And is this when you're in a relationship or is it post a relationship, like after your breakup or is just a toxic situation in itself? So it's either when you're breaking up from that stage where things are very, your attachment and reward mm -hmm. pathways are fully engaged and fired up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if you do enter this kind of toxic situation where it becomes hot and cold mm -hmm. on and off, just like the drug is hot and cold. Yeah. When you have the drug in you, it's like it feels good. When it's not, it's, you feel terrible. So it's a bit of that. It has a lot of similarities with it. And what advice would you give someone who may be in that situation where they are trying to, to heal and break free from that cycle of toxicity. Yeah. So obviously my experience is w w dealing with the addiction. So be it's, Dr. Love it's today. similar, it's similar, <laughs> uh, considering the similarities, a lot of time when I have a patient who has failed mm -hmm. multiple attempts of trying to control or reduce the substance use, we try to do a period of abstinence, maybe indefinite, but maybe at least some short term. Not too different what people recommend in terms of not contacting the person. Uh, trigger management is something huge in our field for relapse, for preventing relapse. Again, not too different from the situation mm -hmm. where you want to control those triggers. Mm -hmm. What reminders do you have of the person? You know, for someone who who's using drugs, you might want to avoid taking the route that leads you to the place where you buy or purchase, you know, like uh, the liquor store, anything that causes that. Same thing here. Maybe mm -hmm. you don't want to go buy this person's place or the restaurant where you had your first date or something that's going to remind you. So you do want to control your triggers. Um, other things that we, we use, again, in the field of addiction that apply here, I think in general, this idea of distress tolerance, mm. uh, which means increasing your ability to handle a negative emotion or a negative state. Because mm -hmm. when you're withdrawing, cravings come back intensely. Mm -hmm. Same thing in this situation, right? When you're in caught in a toxic situation, there's intense cravings mm -hmm. for contact with this person uh, and trying to like, you know, reestablish things and, and mm -hmm. or at least get a reward from them. Get that dopamine hit. Exactly. Um, so you do want to develop those skills. How do you increase your distress tolerance? And this is very based in like mindfulness, right? Where things are going to pass, right? How do you just mm. sit with it and, and learn from it, accept it and let it pass kind of thing? I really appreciated you explaining that and giving this depth of an explanation, um, mentioning abstinence or abstaining. Sorry, is that the word? Abstaining from yeah. seeing someone. So, you know, 
other dating professionals may call this like the no contact rule, like do not contact this person and wait for a period of time um, until you're, you've healed. But what if you're in a situation where that person still has to be in your life, whether they are the, the father or the mother of a child or whether they are a part of a friend group, how can you overcome that addictive side where you just want to keep going and seeing them and getting that dopamine hit? It definitely makes it a lot more complicated because again, that, you know, I'm going to speak in the language that I know, which is the substance use language. It's similar to somebody trying to reduce and con gain control over mm -hmm. using as opposed to being abstinent, mm -hmm. right? So you have to set boundaries. What context are you seeing the person in? Uh, how often do you see them? Uh, what are you doing together? What can they tell you? What can they not? What are you telling them? What are you not? So it's very important to set boundaries. Uh, it will make it more complicated, but you will have to go through, uh, you know, the emotional experience, all the distress, the negative emotions and, and uh, the complicated part of it. Uh, so, yeah, I don't have... I'm not, I'm not the dating this, expert, but so, I don't have specific advice for that situation. So Dr. Dagger is going to be pivoting careers from uh, <laughs> drugs and addictions to love and addiction. I love it. But actually just on that note is we do find that in, in the post breakups uh, or when people are going through difficult times in their life, drug use becomes therapeutic to them. They use drugs in these settings to try to escape or maybe mm -hmm. heal. And we see right now in Canada, as well as in Australia, psychedelics have even been legalized. I just want to know your thoughts on the use of drugs as a form of therapy. So I think there are two things there, and I just want to separate them because they're a little different. Using something as an escape uh, is strongly discouraged. Because that, again, going back to the initial thing we talked about, in terms of predictors of addiction, the substance, the user, and the situation, when you're using things as an escape, that's a bit of that situation. Mm -hmm. That's a high-risk situation because you're filling a void with something else and that something else can't stay either. So what's going to happen when that other thing is removed? What happens to that void? It's still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So very high-risk situation to use as an escape. Now psychedelic-assisted therapy is a whole other thing. In reality, you're doing the very opposite in psychedelic assisted therapy. You're using psychedelics not to escape. In therapy, you're going deeper. Mm. You're taking psychedelics to dive deep into your experience, into your, you know, soul, your past trauma, all those things to try to unravel and get gain new insight. That's the purpose of psychedelic assisted therapy to shift your mindset. It's not studied in the context of heartbreak. It's studied in um, treatment resistant uh, depression or PTSD mm -hmm. is another big one. But maybe, maybe in the maybe future, it it'll be, be. <laughs> could maybe be a could heartbreak. Be. Dr. Dagger, why do people get addicted if someone is hot and cold to them? It's a good question. I think there are many different models to answer that. You know, some sometimes you can look at attachment theory. Like, you know, some people have avoidant versus uh, anxious attachments that might feed into that. Some might tell you about trauma and are we trying to revisit a wound that we had before? But from the perspective of behavioral addictions, uh, there's something called uh, intermittent reinforcement where uh, when you have an unpredictable reward, mm -hmm. that's the biggest driver of effort. Imagine an experiment uh, where you give rats in a cage a lever that dispenses food, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then every time they push that lever, food comes out. Mm -hmm. So they're going to push it when they're hungry, get the food and go back to their normal things. Uh, if you don't give them any food come out, uh, any food from that dispensing thing, they're going to ignore it after a while. They're not going to care about it. They're just going to lose interest and do their thing. But what was noticed in these behavioral studies is that if you change that, make it unpredictable, they become obsessed with pushing it. They start ignoring their self-care and it just becomes the main thing they focus on. 
Do you know where something that we as humans encounter in real life? Um, and again, that goes back to my to the field of addictions and behavioral addictions. And I told you gambling is a common one. Slot machines, right? That's mm -hmm. they, They're heavily based on intermittent reinforcement. Uh, you can imagine if you push the button every time you won, that's just going to become a job. You're going to figure out how to push that button as much as you can to keep winning. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you're going to push it. You're going to get triple sevens. Bells and whistles are going to come on and your reward pathway is activated. Sometimes it's going to be a smaller reward. So it's unpredictable. And that's going to make people, you're going to keep pushing that button. Right. So, so what you're trying to say is if you really want that girl or guy to like you, you got to just be hot and cold so they can be addicted to you. That's what I've gathered from this. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You Engaging guys, healthy relationships. Healthy relationships. But I just wanted no. to, I think the most important takeaway here is that if you uh, feel this addiction to someone, whether it's a relationship, a situation, a person you have a crush on, uh, to ask yourself, is there intermittent reinforcement that's being in place here? Is that person giving you consistent either love or telling you like, no, I do not want to be with you so you can move on. But if that person is giving you, as medical professionals would say, breadcrumbs, uh, then this might be an, something where it's triggering your addiction and that's intermittent reinforcement. Yeah, to and, totally. Um, yeah. Can I tell you two more things that I find so interesting from the world of behavioral addictions that apply to this? Please tell us. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll keep them uh, brief. But one of them, again, used in the world of gambling. There's this con and those are real terms, by the way, that you can look up. There's something called losses disguised as wins. For example, you bet two dollars, you get 50 cents. The machine celebrates you. You get a reward. In reality, you lost a dollar and a half. Mm -hmm. You didn't win 50 cents that you brought up the point of breadcrumbing. And that kind of relates to it when you start feeling that this mm -hmm. bare minimum is a reward, right? The, anything, whether it's bare minimum or even below, starts to activate your attachment and reward pathway. And another one that I find as applicable is, is this idea of an early win. Some casino games are structured around that or even some games that we now have on our phone mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. you know, get the free version. You're going to win 90% of the way, but this last 10% now buy 10 coins then 1% later buy 20 coins. Mm -hmm. And then now you're chasing that early win that you had that they just lured you in with, mm -hmm. which again relates to another term that we hear commonly, love bombing, for example, right? When you go back to chase that initial uh, huge reward that they gave you. So again, I find that's interesting how in, in this field of behavioral addiction, there's things that apply. Again, Absolutely. there are different models to look at toxic mm -hmm. relationship, but I just find how behavioral addiction can present some, uh, I guess, a different perspective or add to the other models. It's it's interesting you mentioned that because you, you know, you went to medical school for medicine, fellowship in addiction, but you can still see how behavioral addiction can be applied in different contexts. One of them being the most common, you know, form of addiction or form of strong dopamine that we that we get, which is in love. Uh, so thank you very much for explaining the difference between intermittent reinforcement and uh, what a healthy relationship also looks like, as well as the effects of a toxic mm -hmm. uh, relationship on you. I want to just now conclude with a few questions. The first question I have is what is the most common misconception about addiction that you see people have? I think the most common misconception is uh, that this is not a problem that I will encounter in my life, whether it applies to me or a loved one, mm. feeling like we're above it. This is only some, something that affects the lesser fortunate. You know, mm. there's a lot. I find that's a big misconception. And that's not the case. As we talked earlier, mm -hmm. we see people, people from all walks of life. Uh, so I think it's it's a bit problematic when you come at it as uh, it's just a matter I pity those unfortunate ones. I think it's something that we have to be humble in front of mm -hmm. and be aware that it can affect anyone. Thank you for saying that. And I do think a lot of, uh, like you said, a lot of people will not think it will apply to them. But it, like you said, it may apply to someone who you love. 
uh, whether it's a friend, a partner, a sibling, and just being able to identify and understanding how you can, uh, as you mentioned earlier, be compassionate and connect them to the right resources Mm -hmm. may literally save lives. Totally. Yeah. Totally. What is the deadliest drug? So the drug that causes the most harm around the world, the most uh, disease and mortality is tobacco. You would not think, eh? Like we talk about, it's fun to talk about party drugs, about the big hitters, about fentanyl, about uh, cocaine and all the things that are more Mm. interesting, but we forget. And again, it goes back to my point earlier about don't think you're above it. Because how many people smoke cigarettes, smoke shisha regularly or anything like that? Uh, you have an addiction, <laughs> right? Damn. So everyone and, here listening, and, and, and you just, have actually uh, the the worst addiction because from all drugs that we have in Canada, for example, if you take the yearly deaths from tobacco, on one hand, they would exceed the combined deaths from alcohol, suicide, murder, and car accidents together. Okay, so basically, Baba's, if you're listening to this and you're smoking <laughs> and you don't want your kid doing weed or drinking, take notes. <laughs> Put your cigarettes, Put your Put your cigarettes, cigarettes down, down before you preach. <laughs> before you preach. You're not above it. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. That's a, that's a very interesting fact. And I yeah. don't think people understand that tobacco is a drug To this as well. day, exactly. To this day, it's a leading uh, modifiable cause of death. Wow. So you mentioned alcohol is the most harmful and tobacco. <laughs> so... Should go. we now substitute alcohol? No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, magic, that ma- is not what we're trying to say. Here. Magic <laughs> mushrooms for everyone. <laughs> magic mushrooms, psychedelics. <laughs> In a therapy context. In a therapy context. Um, I guess the one question I do have actually is there, what are the benefits of doing psychedelics? Again, in a therapy context. There, outside of recreationally, there are no known benefits. Mm-hmm. There could be, but it's just not studied. Mm-hmm. In a therapy context, we use it to treat uh, treatment-resistant depression and PTSD. So it has shown benefits that way that it can treat those conditions okay. when used in therapy context. So therapy context. Don't do exactly. it. Just do it for fun. It's just it's not shown to. It's not, I'm it's just teasing. Studied. I'm just teasing. <laughs> Uh, but I do have the one last question is yeah. that now in the field of addiction and you doing the work that you do, uh, you probably hear a lot of advice that's given to people with addiction. What would you say is the worst piece of advice that can be given to someone to overcome any type of addiction? I think the worst piece of advice is to tell somebody to just stop, which is tempting, honestly, right? When you see somebody, their life is ruined Mm. by regular drug use you want to tell them just stop Mm. but you know what going to our previous conversation about heartbreak or bad relationships how does the advice of get over it work Mm. that doesn't work right it doesn't doesn't heal anyone so same thing here telling somebody to just stop is undermining the whole Mm. process and complexity of this disorder and it just i've never seen anyone cured because of this advice well thank you for sharing sharing that and now just on the flip side what would you say is the best piece of advice you can give to someone to overcome any type of addiction i think helping someone understand that they're not alone telling somebody you're not alone um there is help Mm. and reach out when you're ready i think this is the best thing you can tell somebody who's going through that struggle well, thank you very much for, for saying that and for sharing all of this. Uh, like Dr. Mark Dagger, you know, today you shared with us a lot about drugs and addiction. You explained what addiction is. We went and delved deeper into drug use and understanding what, uh, what is harmful to you. And we also discussed how addiction can also relate on topics of the heart, love, and delving deep into toxic relationships as well as intermittent reinforcement. Uh, thank you for providing uh, advice on what to do if someone you love has an addiction. With that being said, guys, if you enjoyed this episode and if you learned something, please don't forget to rate it five stars. We're streaming on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Rami. You can find us on YouTube. 
With that said, yalla, bye.